we would like to invite General Thompson and Elon Musk to the stage. Morning, everybody. We got about 30 minutes uh, with Elon here. Um, uh, I love the soundtrack that we're uh, listening to throughout the day. We've got the theme or the uh, soundtrack to The Martian, the soundtrack to Interstellar, even the soundtrack to The Stranger Things. So uh, uh, hopefully that has uh, lightened the mood a little, and hopefully you all have had the opportunity to enjoy uh, the expo, uh, some of the public pitches, uh, and some of the panel sessions that uh, have occurred throughout the day. Our guest today uh, needs no introduction. Uh, in the Forbes uh, uh, innovation list for 2019, he was co-number one uh, on that list with uh, Mr. Jeff Bezos. And if you care to comment on that later, you'll have the opportunity. <laughs> Uh, but I will remain silent on that. Uh, he's obviously the founder of a few companies uh, you may all be familiar with, like uh, Tesla Motors and SpaceX. Uh, he's also spent time on the board of a nonprofit, uh, OpenAI, and sponsored innovative competitions uh, like uh, the Hyperloop Initiative. Elon, thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Thanks, Bob. So we'll just dive right in unless anybody has any objections to that. Um, I just have some questions. We're going to be talking about primarily innovation, uh, but interspersed amongst uh, some of our questions on innovation will be some questions on uh, leadership, uh, some questions on uh, culture, especially in the small business growing to a large business kind of environment. and then. Um, I myself never got these questions until five years ago, but I may throw you a couple uh, work-life balance uh, questions, uh, sure. quality of life questions. So uh, without further ado, um, uh, Elon, a critical question that all businesses face uh, when tackling challenges during product development is do we invest the time and the resources to do this work internally? or do we contract it out and have an external partner do it with us? Can you talk to the audience a little bit about what kind of decision process you go through, whether you're deciding to do it in one of your companies or contract it out to somebody else? Well, in the beginning, we try to contract most things out. Uh, but at Tesla and SpaceX, uh, we started off um, with, with most things contracted out. Um, and then that didn't succeed so that we insourced more and more over time. Um, the, in, in space particularly, the supply chain is not great. Um, uh, ITAR restricts you to really working with US companies, or it's very difficult to work with non-US companies, um, because space rockets are a weapons technology. So you have a very limited set of suppliers. And to the degree that you um, have legacy parts, uh, you inherit the legacy uh, costs and limitations. And so uh, that required us to insource most of the rocket. Uh, there's probably only less than 10% of, of, of the rocket is coming from the space supply chain at this point. Um, the, or, some automotive supply chain is better, consumer electronics is, is, is a lot better. Wherever there's a lot of competition, the supply chain is better. So it really depends on the part. Um, but it, it's important to bear in mind that leg legacy components mean legacy cost limitations. Um, if you want to have something revolutionary, you can't do catalog engineering. Yeah. Catalog engineering is, is, is not, it's, it's limited, you know, limited ingredients. So the legacy industrial base isn't able to adapt fast enough to what you're, what you're trying to do, so you insource it. Are there any special techniques or um, uh, cultural aspects of that insourcing that you, find, you found to be particularly uh, beneficial in Tesla or SpaceX? Well, I really think it's just like if you, if you want to advance technology, You've, you've got to recruit the world's best engineers and then create an environment which enables them to be as innovative as possible. So the reward structure, you know, 
do you need to really reward and encourage innovation um, and, uh, and, and punish lack of innovation. So it's got to be both. It's just a stick and carrot. Um, well, you know, ideally more carrot than stick. Um, that's my new philosophy. <laughs> more carrot, less stick. Here's a, I say yes. Um, <laughs> But, but uh, yeah, it's, it's so the now the, the thing is that in, in, in a lot of companies this is you have a uh, risk reward asymmetry where um, bold moves are if they go wrong are punished um, and but it, but sort of keeping your head down is not, is not punished mm -hmm. that that's not good that will result in a very conservative outcome um, so it, it has to be. Um, a requirement that there is significant advancement, and if and, and simply the lack of doing something significant is bad. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this is big, big companies just become really conservative over time, and really the the the, 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 the government is a company in the limit. So it, it is, the government is the biggest company. Yeah. So we have some we have some big companies in the audience, but we have a lot of small businesses in the audience. Right. Um, so not part of the, if you will, the legacy supply chain for rockets or whatever other innovation you were a company that you were associated with might be producing. Is there some advice or counsel that you could give to some of these small businesses about how to market? to uh, growing uh, space partnerships like SpaceX or other companies that might be willing to admit them to the supply chain if they don't have that old think or that old process mentality? Well, for, for, for SpaceX or Tesla, I mean, if somebody has got a, a, a component that's better than what, what we're making internally, we, we would love to uh, buy that for sure. Um, we would just reallocate the resources that we're working on that component to um, do something else. Uh, so, like for example, on Falcon 9, uh, we used to build the landing legs, the you know big carbon fiber landing legs that, that fold out uh, ourselves, and then we contracted it out to All American Racing. And they do not no, used to like, no one do like racing cars. Hmm? And they did a great job; they were doing better than us. So we we, we handed the building lights to them and worked on other things. Okay. So it, it, this, is a, it, this is by no means, like it would be completely insane for us to want to uh, continue to make a part ourselves internally that is inferior to a part that is available externally. That would matter. Um, so we, we'd love to outsource more. It would be great. Um, yeah. So that's a pretty high bar, but if you do it better than SpaceX, then they, they'd like to talk to you, okay? <laughs> Um, Elon, uh, given your uh, extensive experience in the nonprofit arena uh, with companies like OpenAI that I mentioned in the introduction, and your ability to tap into um, the academic environment, that cutting edge uh, innovation in our environment with things like the Hyperloop competition, are there smart ways for the folks in the audience, this community of space professionals, to be engaging with different sources of innovation in the ecosystem. How do we better cultivate those sources of innovation so that we can take advantage of them um, in our nation's space capabilities? Okay, well, <clears throat> in open, I wouldn't say I'm like an expert in nonprofits, but uh, OpenAI was really intended to mitigate the risk of uh, artificial general intelligence. I hope that it I hope that that's what it does. It, it, there's some chance it may amplify the risk, but hopefully it diminishes the risk. Um, and, and then I have a, a sort of a foundation that gives gives away you know, money mostly anonymously. So um, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on this. Uh, yeah. what, what I'm mostly trying to do is figure out the set of actions that in, increase the probability that the future is good. Um, and take those actions. Okay. Aspirationally, at least. Okay. So, is there um, um, are there techniques that you personally use to identify sources of information? I mean, is it is it just 
reading or seeing what's out there? Do you have uh, a continuous market research going on in your companies or in your private life about, hey, what's out there that I should be um, uh, sponsoring or taking advantage of to make things better than they are? I do, I do zero market research whatsoever. Okay. <laughs> we don't even have a marketing department, really. Uh, or advertising, or any, it's just like, what it would be a great car or a great rocket, you know? So it's like, I try to think of like, what is the platonic ideal of, say, the perfect rocket or car? Uh, what characteristics would it have? And, and then make that. And then to, I find that if you do that, people want to buy it. Okay. Um, and it, it's, that's it. And, you know, like, we're going to come out with the Tesla pickup truck, or we call it a cyber truck. I mean, it looks like an armored personnel carrier from the future. Um, yeah, it's like, it'll look like a normal truck. Uh, people might not like it, it might not. I, don't know, I like it. <laughs> Sounds like a couple other people do too. It's gonna look like a cable from movie set when it goes down the road. You're like, whoa, what is that thing? <laughs> it's literally bulletproof. Okay. <laughs> I look forward to seeing it uh, and perhaps driving it at some point in the future. Um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, yeah, like, if I can elaborate on that, like, like I think a lot of times I think people try to make products that they think others would love, but they don't love them themselves. And if, if you don't love the product, you should not expect that others will. Um, like, you, 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 you yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you know your own heart, and, and if, it, if it's compelling to you, it will be compelling to others. Okay, great. Yeah. So, from a leadership perspective, um, obviously, um, um, you started as a leader of a small business. Um, you grew a number of small businesses into large businesses. So from your early days at, uh, at uh, Zip2 and PayPal, uh, leading very, very small teams of uh, uh, developers, sometimes uh, uh, doing a lot of the development yourself, uh, hands-on, uh, today, to today as you lead very large companies like Tesla Motors and SpaceX, um, has your leadership approach changed at all, or is managing those small teams, do you try and keep that culture uh, and your leadership uh, style the same throughout? Well, it, it, it definitely has to evolve as companies get bigger. Tesla is around 45,000 people, and SpaceX is almost 7,000 people. Um, and uh, you know, when a company is little, then your, your, your skill as a sort of a, like an individual engineer can make a, a very big difference. Um, when a company is large, you have to kind of teach a lot of people to do it. You, you have to you, you have to be a force multiplier, um, as opposed to like if, if you have a little band, uh, like if you know if you're like a dozen swordsmen or something, and you're an ace swordsman, okay, great, you can, that's going to make a difference in a little battle, but it, it, not if you have 12,000. Yeah. <laughs> like, you, um, you can't, like, run along the entire battle line. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, so you have to try to um, t uh, teach people on mass different approaches um, and just make sure that the, uh, in, the that, that you reward the right behavior that the reward structure is um, incenting the right behavior. This is incredibly important. Um, economics 101, whatever you incent is likely to happen. In fact, it would be bizarre if it didn't. Um, so st statistically speaking, it will definitely be, be what happens. So the incentive structure, uh, re reward and punishment must be sensible. Um, and, and this sounds very obvious, but in, in most organizations, the, the, the tr true reward and punishment is not sensible, and then people are puzzled why they do not get the outcome that they want. It's because the reward structure isn't right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So as businesses grow, as your businesses have grown, and it becomes less and less about 
the engineer talking to the program manager one-on-one -on -one in, a, in a very small team environment, and it becomes conversations between different teams in your enterprise, much larger groups of people. There's a, in, in many organizations, there's a tendency that seams will develop, and yes. leaders have to manage those seams. How, or, or insist that their teams manage those seams. How have you managed the seams in the large businesses that you manage currently? And I think that's a, that's, a, that's a great point that you're making in the question. Um, in, in any given product, you, you can see the mistake, the organizational errors manifest themselves in the errors in the product. So you can see like, um, the, you know, and I see this in our own products. It's like, uh, we, we, you know, we, we uh, you know, for like for, for example, we've got like a uh, a top cover of the battery, um, and we've got a bottom cover on the car. Like, okay, that's an example of an organizational error. We should only have one cover. You don't need a box in a box. But but there's the battery team and the and, and the body and chassis team, and so they they both made a cover. Um, you know, you'll see sort of flanges and joints and various things that don't make sense or where, where things are doubled up um, and where you have subsystem optimization uh, instead of uh, overall system optimization. Um, so to counteract that, which is not easy, uh, I actually in, in, insist that teams uh, step on each other's toes. So if, if um, you, you, so, like in, in the rocket, the propulsion, propulsion team, the engine team, um, has to go part way into the airframe, um, and the airframe team has to go part way into the engine. Um, it's, it's but it's hard. It's hard to get people to do that, um, and so, but, but essentially, they have to um, basically offend other people in the company, and but not be offended themselves. Okay. So, this is very important. Um, and, and, and one of the things I've tried to, to, try to propagate is that everyone should be chief engineer. Like, meaning everyone, everyone should have at least a, a, a sort of cursory understanding of the whole rocket or the whole car, um, even though they may have deep expertise in one arena. Uh, then they, they'll be able to tell if, if they're optimizing for the, for the product as a whole. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, generally, I find like the you, you can summarize the key characteristics of of, uh, of, of, of each discipline. You, you can simplify it down to a few principles. There's like uh, you know, Richard Feynman used to say that you really know your subject if you can explain it to a smart ten-year-old. But if you try to sort of disguise your expertise in, in obscure language then you know, maybe you don't understand what you're talking about. Um, so, um, you know, like, like for example, like when, the, when say, a rocket's coming back from, from, from orbit, um, you, you know, the, you have like center of pressure and center of mass, and, and um, it effect effectively, it, 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 also, it all sounds very complicated, but basically you just have a seesaw. Um, so, if the things of, of, of approximately uh, equal density, um, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's just going to be, it, it, you know, if you put mass on one side, it's going to tip that way. If you put mass on the other side, it's going to tip the other way. Um, and think of it just like a seesaw. And, and, and then, then, like, you'll see the mass distribution either makes sense or doesn't make sense. Well, the, the, the flaps are too big on one side or the other. Uh, you know, there's, yeah. Um, yeah. I think other examples, but anyway, I think a good principle is that everyone sh should be should try to have a broad understanding of the product as a whole, so, and, and that that's um, that's very important. Yeah, makes a big difference. So, other than the 